Hi, everyone. Good morning. This is Jessica Rodriguez from UNICEF. First, I just want to make sure that you all can hear me. So if you can type in and let us know that um, the audio is working well, that would be great. Okay, great, thank you. It sounds like and seems like most of you can hear and the audio is of good quality. So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we are delighted to be hosting a three-day webinar series um, as part of the UNICEF Learning Collaborative and we are kind of broadcasting live from the uh, Pediatric Adolescent Treatment Africa Regional Summit, uh, which is taking place in Johannesburg, South Africa from the 23rd of October through the 25th. Um, it is a meeting that really highlights all of the barriers, best practices and lessons learned in finding, testing, treating and caring for children and adolescents living with HIV. And we are really excited to feature the findings and learnings exchanged at this regional summit um, as part of the learning collaborative because this learning collaborative aims to um, use and build on learning at the front lines to shape policy and sustain improvements in the HIV response, especially for children and adolescents. So we are really excited uh, to be here today. Uh, with me co-moderating is Dr. Elvin Gang, who's an associate professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. So we're also glad that he's here with us and he will be co-moderating this webinar. Um, I will also uh, like to introduce our speakers today, uh, Luan Hatan of PATA, who is the executive director of PATA. Uh, based here in South Africa. We also have with us Immaculate Monica Awar from Mitiana Hospital in Uganda, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Akello Okoth from Egpath, Kenya, and Dr. Neha Ramanlal from Ariel Glazer, um, Mozambique. So we are glad that they are uh, sharing all of the evidence that they have generated from their projects and facilities in their respective countries with us today. A few minor housekeeping issues before we get started. Um, first, I just want to remind everyone if you're having problems hearing, try to log in and out of the call, call or restart your computer um, as a last resort if, if nothing else is working. Um, also, kindly place your mics on mute as that will prevent any interference or echoing and will ensure the best uh, quality of the webinar. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to just type a message and we'll respond to them as best as we can. In terms of the uh, order and agenda for the webinar, uh, we will start with opening remarks from the executive director of PATA and then move on to the three presentations after which we will break for a brief question and answer period. And you can type in your questions and we will uh, repeat them out loud and uh, respond to them. All of the presentations will be shared after the webinar and we will be recording the webinar so that you can um, hear it and share it with your colleagues as well. So without any further ado, I will turn it over to Luan Hatan of PATA, um, who will provide some opening remarks. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Jessica, and lovely to be here, and even more wonderful to have so many people here in Johannesburg at the 13th PATA Continental Summit, um, entitled Towards an AIDS-Free Africa, Delivering on the Frontline. Um, so we kicked off to a great start this morning with about 200 participants here in Johannesburg um, and started with a warm welcome to the many delegates, the 58 health facilities and 120 frontline health providers, key sector partners and ministries of health. Um, as the 13th Pata Summit, 
Um, we also, we could go to the next slide. Um, we also actually celebrated a decade of PATA as an organization. Um, so we're having a bit of a birthday celebration and 12 years since the very first PATA summit. Um, we can go to the next slide. And just explaining a little bit about the PATA methodology um, of bringing stakeholders together to build regional action around pediatric and adolescent HIV treatment care and support. Um, so PATA summits and forums are the foundation to growing the PATA network and expanding its scope of work and sharing emerging pediatric and adolescent promising practices. Um, and key to our methodology is really engagement with and between health providers um, to share experiences with peers, to access global guidance and technical input, and to discuss operational barriers and solutions um, in service delivery on the ground. Um, whilst having key policy makers and stakeholders um, in the room together with us. Um, just to tell you a little bit about who's here um, at the summit at the moment. Um, so as I explained, we have 58 um, health clinic teams and the teams who come to the Pata Summit from over 15 countries um, constitute uh, someone from a clinical role and someone also in a, a psychosocial role. So we have um, a number of clinic staff here, um, Ministry of Health officials, and many partner organizations working in the region as well, um, together with uh, a number of young people, peer supporters also working on the front line um, and who participate in the PATA Youth Advisory Panel. Um, you can see just from the slides, uh, in terms of, you know, most of the facilities represented are urban, but with quite a good mix. Um, and 40% actually of the facilities um, and clinic teams attending this year, 40% of them are, are new facilities. And um, we can go to the next slide. So just in, in terms of the, the facilities that are here present uh, at the summit for these three days, um, you know, people have reported that just within this small, small little footprint in Africa, just within the last 12 months, 248, 186 infants, children and adolescents and young people were tested um, within the last 12 months period. Um, with 8% of those tested testing positive. Um, what we can also tell just from the applications was that 84,860 infants and children and adolescents are currently on ART um, from the 58 facilities that are here with us. Um, however, only 49% of those are currently virally suppressed. Um, some of the facilities raised um, general themes and concerns, and I think those link quite centrally, essentially, to the, the themes for the Pata Summit, which, as you've explained, relate to find and test, um, which is really focused today and day one, and all the presenters today will be focused on, on um, strategies around finding and testing, giving an overview of progress made against the global plan, but really sharing the innovations and, and different practices from the front line. Um, so that's really exciting. And I'm not going to tell you about tomorrow because um, I'm hoping people will sign in again tomorrow. And that's on treat and care. Um, but yeah, I think for me, that's probably all. I could maybe do one slide and tell you a little bit about how the day works, um, just in terms of the structure. We could go to the next one, yes. So just uh, to give a little um, information on how the, the day is, is structured, we start every day with a plenary, and 
and um, we have an amazing group of, of speakers sharing each day, obviously focusing either on, on today is, is binding, tomorrow will be testing, and day three will be care. And then um, the groups go into the Africa Cafe, which is really quite a, a rapid <laughs> uh, time where we have two case studies that are shared. And then the presenters move to the next room and there's a lot of interaction and questions and answers. And these are real examples from the front line in terms of um, strategies and best practices um, that uh, facilities are, are undertaking. And then um, actually at the moment, uh, groups are having um, peer dialogues. So this is where doctors and nurses together from different countries um, and then counselors and social workers separately are in their own spaces and they're really talking about some of the barriers and challenges that they're experiencing in service delivery, um, but thinking about that in relation to their own role um, and looking at uh, identifying really what's working, what's not working so well. And that comes back into a moderated panel session um, later this afternoon. And then um, this evening, which we're all very excited about, <laughs> we have a, a gala evening. But more importantly than that, um, Pata will be uh, celebrating a number of health providers um, through the first uh, Pata Awards that are going to be provided. And I think very central to the CS Summit is, is really the recognition of frontline health providers. Um, and really wanting um, to call attention to the fact of um, building resilience on the front line, acknowledging and valuing health providers. Because in terms of reaching global targets, um, it's really health providers on the front line who, who are going to get us through the last mile to ensure that we are going to see the end of AIDS in the next few years. So thank you so much and, and yeah, thanks very much. Thank you, Luann, um, for your opening remarks and for providing an overview of the summit. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Immaculate Monica Awar from Mintiana Hospital in Uganda. She will presenting on be presenting on unfinished business indexed case index case testing to find and link HIV positive children and adolescents to care. Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for, for listening, for being here. Um, my name is Imachet Monica Awar. I work with uh, Malvin in Uganda in Metiana Hospital under the Elma project as a counselor. Um, Malvin in Uganda is a faith-based organization that models quality and sustainable prevention, care and treatment of HIV and other health priorities using a family-centered approach, together with training, education, and research. Michana Hospital, with the help of, of Mausme Uganda through the EOMA project, is implementing family-centered approach in the HIV care, whereby the index case leads to finding out of the serial status of the other family members. The major objective of EOMA focuses on finding and linking HIV positive, positive children and adolescents to appropriate care and treatment. The major way of finding these children is by strategizing testing children and adolescents of the index clients. The China Hospital currently has 5,221 adults and 577 children and adolescents in HIV care and treatment. That is July, September. 2017 report. What we did um, following the 2015 UNITES report on the gap between adults and pediatric HIV, the need to find more children and adolescents and link them to care was realized to achieve the first 90. 
There's a project, Elma project, the unfinished business was started in October 2015, aiming at fast tracking 393 children, zero to 14 years, and 128 adolescents, 15 to 19 years, in two and a half year in Mitiana Hospital. By September 2017, we have got 114 children, 0 to 14 years, and 117 adolescents, 15 to 19 years. Next. How we did it, um, staff recruitment. Recruited a counselor for children and adolescents for HIV care-related activities. Of course, that is me here. I'm the Elma counselor in the hospital, and I'm proud to be one, and I'm so proud to work with the children and adolescents. Mentorship mentored available health care providers to offer quality HIV care to index clients' children. And in the hospital, as well as a counselor, I also do mentorship as well to, to ensure that there's sustainability. Then health education, strength and health education at chronic care units to encourage index clients to test all their children. Yeah, the health education is, is done daily during the clinic days to encourage parents who are HIV positive to ensure that they test their children and know their HIV serious status to improve life. Outreach activities, conducted Know Your Child Status campaigns, home-based engagements and testing, and then networking, partnering with community networks, testing children through CDDP, this is community drug distribution points where drugs are taken to the community and, and distributed to them. So in this case, we encourage the, the caretakers, the guardians who are getting their medicine to come with their children for HIV testing. HIV policies, use, use of family tracking tool, testing all admitted children, that is in the wards, pediatric wards, and adolescents, pregnant and breastfeeding women, every three months and linkage of all found HIV positive. Next, please. Challenges encountered along the way. Um, we have stigma, non-disclosure among couples, poor couple testing, less men involved in healthcare process. Here in um, um, non-disclosure, of course, uh, you may be a mother or a father, but you've never disclosed your serious status or your HIV status to your partner. So in most cases, you come to the hospital and the counselor health workers are encouraged you to bring your children, but it becomes hard for you to bring a child to test because you have not yet disclosed. Then poor attitude, reluctancy of some index clients to test their children. Then poverty, inadequate capacity of index clients to access frequent care long distances to health facilities, or feeding standards. Um, we have some successes testing, testing for HIV saved our lives. Well, we have that little beautiful girl who came to the hospital and she was all over wounded, but later was tested and enrolled in two care. The mother later also found out about her HIV status and actually accepted to start care after being cancelled. So we are proud of that, that we saved life. Um, we have a number of children we have tested from the index clients. We tested over 4,092 children from index clients. And from there, we got the 82 children that were HIV positive, and we managed to link all the 82. Best practices and key lessons. Um, we have adequate comprehensive counseling services, community-based testing, weekly and monthly, quarterly and annual reporting. We, we are in a project, so at least every week we need to know how we are performing. If we have a target to achieve, then we really need to make sure we do quarterly report, weekly report, and sit down as a team and discuss uh, where, what went wrong, how did we achieve this, how did we do it and we manage? We have CMEs and continuous review of national and guidelines, national guidelines, peer-to-peer -peer counseling and sharing, continuous quality improvement activities, strengthening the adolescent and pediatric clinics, partnership with relevant stakeholders like the community-based organization, 
community health workers, peer educators, private health facilities as well. How these lessons are applicable and scalable to frontline providers? One, healthcare providers. Uh, as healthcare providers, we need to do continuous HIV testing and counseling. Continuous mentorship for quality service provision is very important as we provide services to the children as well and adolescents. Partners adapt the practices. Policymakers create new, new tools that encourage compulsory testing for in-depth clients. Vill village health teams um, mobilize people to come for testing. Community sensitization, ensuring proper and complete linkages to care. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Immaculate. And I know um, I had the honor of hearing Immaculate give her presentation this morning, and she was very passionate. So I'm sure she'll be happy to answer um, any questions later on in the webinar. Um, next, we will turn it over to Dr. Elizabeth Akilowakoth from EGPATH Kenya. And the title of her presentation is Optimizing and Expanding HIV Testing for Children and Adolescents, New Technologies and Approaches. the two projects work, that's the UNITED and the ELMA supported uh, project. Uh, basically, the counties which have been uh, surrounded yellow, and uh, they are actually part of the nine priority uh, counties in Kenya. That's the uh, counties with the highest burden or that contribute around 65% of new HIV infections. Um, Starting with the point of care EID project, uh, it's meant to optimize the EID networks through introducing point of care uh, for early infant diagnosis to increase the number of infants who are tested and initiated on treatment. Um, so we, in partnership with UNITED, uh, EGPATH is implementing uh, the project in nine countries over the four years. And it's estimated that uh, Around 290 point of care EID platforms will be established and over 320,000 tests. Uh, Kenya alone uh, will be able to support around 41,000 EID tests. Uh, that shows us the gap in current uh, EID uh, cascade. Uh, they are currently around uh, approximately 1.2 million HIV exposed uh, infants, that's in the 21 priority uh, countries. Uh, among these, around approximately 51% of them, of the infants, uh, get tested at two months of, of age, and around only 50% of those ones who get their EID test get the test uh, results returned, that is, to their caregivers. Uh, among those diagnosed positive, again, only around 51% are initiated on treatment. Uh, in Kenya, uh, the PMTCT coverage is at around 75%, and infant HT coverage is 76%. Uh, in terms of EID coverage at six weeks, is at 68%. And just to mention, Kenya has is already moving now to, you know, um, there's now the birth testing. So ideally, <laughs> if we are still struggling with that six weeks, I think uh, we, we are going to work very closely uh, with the ministry uh, to build capacities to roll out the new guidelines which uh, uh, yeah, which enable the birth testing. And then the caregivers that receive EID test results are around 98, but it's greatly, you know, uh, 
after a very long turnaround time of median turnaround time of about 56 days. That's from the time the sample is collected up to the time that the caregiver uh, gets the test results. So the idea is that uh, delays the initiation of, uh, uh, you know, initiation of treatment. So some of the county specific barriers to EID include uh, delay in the yeah, delay in return of test results and the coverage. So those are some of the key uh, things that the project is uh, addressing. Uh, the, the project in the project again, EGPA works very closely with the Ministry of Health uh, through a point of care technical working group, uh, which is headed by the National Health Control Program and the National Health Reference Lab. And uh, EGPA provides the TA and also the, uh, you know, coordination and here yeah, and secretariat work. Uh, so there was site selection in terms and some of the criteria was number of EID tests done that was checking the volume. Uh, and then the selection was also looking at in terms of those facilities, what is the unmet, you know, uptake or the need. So looking at all the uh, HIV positive women or pregnancies and then following up to see uh, what proportion of their infants uh, had EID test within two months. Also uh, for consideration was turnaround time. If a facility was having a very long turnaround time, uh, maybe the hub or, because in Kenya, uh, with the conventional uh, EID network, there are only like seven reference laboratories. So the hubs all have to, the spoke sent to the hub, which then sent to these seven reference labs. So it takes a very long uh, uh, turnaround time and then the geographical distance was considered. Yeah, so the successes, um, this in the Kenya um, United project um, uh, had a bit of delay, so it's just being rolled out. Uh, the first facility that was actually enrolled was in August. So in September is when the first sites are uh, starting to roll this out. So the first 200 infants that received the EID test had a median turnaround of, you know, some had got it the same day, uh, their the test results, and some had a bit of delay, and that's because uh, for some of the samples, uh, some of, you know, uh, those clans already were given, uh, you know, a TCA or a clinical appointment to come after maybe one month or something. But uh, ideally, um, once it hits the ground uh, and there's good training, then the hub sites will have, you know, a turnaround time of zero days and the spoke sites uh, seven, uh, up to seven days maximum, but between zero to seven days. The EID data is uh, now available in the National EID database, thanks to working with the technical working group headed by the Ministry of Health. And the POC EID products included the global fund proportion, and also the uh, it's already institutionalized within the national policy and strategy documents. Uh, yeah, so going to the ELMA supported, uh, project for case finding. Again, why do we build a case for Kenya in children? We have, I mean, in Kenya, we have about 28,000 positive children uh, out of the 1.5 million Kenyans living with HIV. Uh, no, very low knowledge of status among adolescents. It stands at about 49%, but it's still higher among girls compared to boys. And then we have young people contributed, you know, 15 to 24 contributed 51% of all the adult, new adult HIV infections in 2015. So that's a worry because uh, ideally among adults, uh, the new infections dropped. Uh, among the children, it also dropped, but among the adolescents, it was still going up. Yeah, because of, you know, low risk perceptions, issues about SGBV, stigma, drug, and other things. Uh, so what did we do? Um, we did work with the national decentralized government and health authorities and the healthcare providers. Uh, we recruited, trained the counselors, the triage assistants, and other healthcare workers working at the CCC because we wanted you know, to really expand and uh, scale up PITC. So the training was not only just a refresher on testing, but also brought the guidelines, issues of intensive case finding, and all other things introduced pediatric and adolescent screening tools, but this is also in line with our guidelines. So for example, if they're screening, of course, the first thing is to check if the child had not been tested, then of course they have to be tested. And if they've been tested, then they'll go to the assessment questions, which uh, look at the risk exposure and also some of the retesting um, 
uh, guidelines and then the trade assistant will you know uh, guide uh, that client to the to the HTS counselor who will then you know uh, do the entire uh, testing protocol procedure. Uh, then we scaled up testing in the child and adolescent uh, centered uh, sites like OPD by beefing, beefing up some of the staff that could test even during weekend or school holidays or in the evening when children are out of school. Uh, you know, dashboards just to track how is testing coverage in IPD and also in the MCH because that's where we have the under five. Uh, clinic, the ANCPNC, where we have the adolescent girls, and then again, routine testing of breastfeeding adolescent mothers who are negative in ANC and labor and delivery, and also supported buffer test kits. That shows a triage system doing screening uh, at the hospital uh, just yeah, before the clients are, and the, the other sign is a, a, a sign. Uh, to show that there are services available in the evening when children are from school, but the adolescents are also on Saturday. Uh, this shows just from a few, some of the pilot sites that we started with in terms of the using the pediatric and adolescent screening tool. And uh, as you can see in terms of yield or identification, it's more enhanced if we compare to the, because that is only one month, like four weeks that, uh, you know, we've piloted, uh, but it's much better than when we compare to the quarter just before that. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of index case testing, again, um, uh, we did introduce like the index contact register and tracing forms. We have uh, we sensitized uh, some of the peer educators, the healthcare workers that also do sensitization at the comprehensive care clinics and during the psychosocial support groups. Uh, enhanced contact line listing at enrollment on care because ideally most of the new newly uh, people were newly enrolled on care. That is where you are likely to find that their uh, their contacts have not been uh, tested, and some of them also maybe are not virally suppressed. So it's easier that, you know, it's uh, there where you are likely to get, you know, issues of maybe the mother, or they are still uh, transmitting to the baby. Yeah, then um, again, we had a mop-up of contacts of index clients that were missed before this project startup. Then we've gone ahead to now follow also index clients who died within the last uh, two years that may have been missed uh, in terms of this testing. And there we work closely with the CCC uh, staff because they have the records on not only loss to follow up, but to death and also uh, in the inpatient facilities. So it's enlisted and they're tested at the, at the uh, mobilized and tested at facility or at home. But it's a new, it's a new initiative that we've tried for one month and it's showing some yield. Uh, and then the, the families also link us to others within the same home because in Africa we have homesteads. So if they were disclosed in some cases, the other house houses or within that home also agree for to be tested. Next. Yeah, so this shows uh, some of the, uh, I think in this slide, we just wanted to show that as much as we've been doing index case testing, you can still approach it and use a different you know, categories of people as the index case. Yeah, because uh, mostly people just think of the adult as the index case and mostly, most of those adults are women. But then we realized what about where it's only the adolescent who is enrolled on care in that site. So that adolescent becomes an index case and during their psychosocial support group, they come with the siblings. That adolescent becomes an index case and with them, we are able to, you know, trace on their partners for th those ones who are willing to bring their sexual partners to be tested. And then also we have a family care model where if you have two or three family members on road on care, then we have harmonized clinic days. So during those days, we also tell them to mobilize any other members of the family that have not been tested. There's normally supported disclosure and appropriate time they are tested. And it's interesting to show that using different entries, we are getting different you know, positivity. And the next thing we want to try is using men as an entry as the, the index client, yes. Uh, so the last one is the targeted community testing. And here again, we did go through the community strategies where we train the community health volunteers for uh, mobilization and sensitizing of the communities and carrying out testing campaigns. Then liaising with the facilities and the health and the HTS providers from the facilities, 
uh, they were able to go out and do testing in selected epidemic hotspots because just universal community testing was not giving yield. So we targeted the fish landing beaches and sugar belts. And uh, also we did um, partner with the Ministry of Health during the immunization campaigns like polio and also during uh, nutrition activities in Kenya, we have what we call Malizibora, good nutrition. And there's normally like a week which is blocked for that and children come with the parents. Uh, so some of um, the, you can see some of the positivity like beach testing, it, it, it was done, you know, uh, out of 160, there were around 12 positives. And also it, during the Malizibora, it's a bit high. Yeah, so most of these strategies, let's go to the next, as you can see, if you compare to just the normal, you know, uh, prevalence among children in Kenya, it's higher uh, than just the normal testing. The challenges, again, the Kenya policy, consent aid is still at 15 years. Sometimes we do have children who come directly from school or somewhere to come and pick drugs or to the hospital. So we have to see how to follow up so that they can get the parents for testing. Uh, Kenya Ministry of Education still does not allow testing in schools, uh, even if they're within the you know, high HIV burden counties. Stigma issues, uh, national tools, yes, they've moved a bit. Uh, they are now you know, having those uh, well-refined, disaggregated by ages and some delivery points, but it's yet to be you know, completely rolled out. And I think one of this project is one of the projects that really pushed for it and showed how, you know, disaggregated data can really help in supporting data for decision making. Then long turnaround time for spoke sites due to some of the healthcare workers, you know, uh, less knowledge and importance of results return to caregiver. So that's one of the things we are working, you know, uh, with the united project to do a lot of sensitization. The final slide, then some of the key lessons, smart testing enhances identification. And then we can use different categories of index classes entry. Uh, to enhance the index case testing. Uh, pregnancy, um, of course, uh, is also one of the entry points to testing of adolescent girls. Targeted community testing gave better yield than the universal community testing, but our testing increased uptake and in uh, UNITED, again, the multi-stakeholder engagement and engagement of the Ministry of Health uh, really worked. Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And uh, we will now ask Dr. Neha Ramanlal from, from Fundasau Area of Glazer in Mozambique to present on family case finding using mobile technology. And as we load the presentation, if you have any questions for clarification for Immaculate Elizabeth, feel free to type them in now as Neha is uh, giving her presentation. So I'm going to present a family TV-oriented case finding using mobile technology in Matoa City in Mozambique. And this platform is called InfoModel. So this is a summary of presentation. Um, mobile technology, the InfoModel, arose from the need to strengthen and monitor the link between the health facility and the community through referencing patients from diverse community approaches and also standardize and change the kinds of activities carried out by athletes in the community. Next. The main objective of InfoModel is to improve overall access, follow-up, adherence, presentation of TB and HIV patients in clinical care and treatment from index case at the health facility. Next. Uh, so, uh, Ariel Glazer uh, works in Mozambique in two provinces, very south, Maputo province, and very north, Cabo Delgado province. In Maputo province, uh, we are implementing the platform in, in Matola City in seven sites. And uh, we are working with the index patients uh, as TB sensible and MDR patients, co infected HIV and TB, HIV positive pregnant and lactating women, HIV exposed children, adults, and children on ART and defaulters patients. So the intervenients of this platform are active. The main intervene is activists, which communicate with the patient in the community. And two other uh, interveners are a case manager and supervisor in the health facility. 
So data flow of the information comes from the uh, electronic patient tracking system, which is our data, electronic database for the HIV positive patients and for the TB and lactating woman and exposed child for HIV comes from paper register tools. This information of index patients uh, are imported, exported to case manager platform, which then uh, uh, send the information to a activist platform. The activists receive the list of the patients, index patients, and go in the community and do the screening and testing and send back the information to the case manager platform and which will, uh, will be able to, um, to update the information in EPTS. Also, there is a, pl a supervisor platform who, who does the monitoring and evaluation of activist activity in the community. So there are three, three uh, applications, one for the case manager, another for activists, and another for supervisor. The case manager uh, application has models such as index page allocation, list, manual TB register and act as uh, act uh, for the lactating women and exposed children, uh, triangulation application. This application is for the default patients. So case manager, when register the default patient, he has to, to cross-check all information of regarding the defaulters if they are true. So then after that, he allocates for the activists. There is also application for reception of referred patients uh, from the activists. Electronic uh, data, uh, electronic uh, patient, patient tracking system updates. If the activist does any uh, update in the, the field, he updates then in the electronic based system. Also, correction of patient information. If the activist correct anything in the field in the community, uh, the case manager has to update the information in clinical files at health facility. Uh, at health facility. Also, the case manager have viral load register and other libraries of register such as TB. And this information also has, uh, is going then to send, be sent to the activist platform. Next. In the activist platform, they have uh, application of index patient list, default patient list, health education. In the health education package, they have audio and visuals for counseling and testing uh, of uh, patient. Um, uh, also have the adherence and rotation package for the patients, uh, nutritional programs and TB and HIV positive prevention programs. Uh, there is a family register and testing application. So the activists go in, in, the, in the community and register and test and screen for TB and HIV to all patients and they register in the platform. And the follow-up visit application is all index patients are follow-up in this platform during six months. After six months, uh, the patient is removed from the platform and is included in uh, uh, GAC, which is the group of adhesion and adherence and rotation group of uh, our patients. If in any moment the patient becomes uh, defaulted, then automatically uh, the patient is included in the platform. Next. And for the supervisor module, there is an application for activities monitoring, activities comments, and technical platform. So a supervisor can monitor all the activities done by the activists in the health, in the community. He does a mentorship, super, a supervision, and resolves all the technical problems that he has in the field with the platform. And the results uh, till now, so we, I'm going to present the results from 2016 until 17. We allocated uh, 12,000 HIV TB index patients. From those uh, located, 69% uh, patient uh, was located and 31% was not located. This not located was because of the uh, register problems of the address, insufficient, insufficient information or error of register of address. 
So at the moment, we are working with a checklist for all the new patients that are enrolled in the in the care and treatment service. We make sure that there is all information needed so when the activist find the house, he can reduce the coordinates and in the fall, and he can, he is going to be able to follow up during six months uh, um, by using the coordinates of the, the house. Uh, the, pay, uh, the index patients profile uh, uh, from those who were allocated. So we have 75% of patients of with uh, adults with HIV, 6% uh, of children with HIV, um, pregnant women, 11%, and 5% of TB patients uh, was allocated. So from those 8,000. Uh, index TBHIV patients uh, allocated, uh, 4,000 were partners and 7,000 children. From those uh, household members registered, 47% uh, of partners didn't know their serial status and 90% of children also didn't know. From those who um, almost 96% of partners were tested and 88% of children. From those tested, um, we had 26% uh, of prevalence of HIV in the partners in the community, and this corresponds with the prevalence of HIV in Matola city, it's about 22%. And for the children, we have only 1% one, 1 of uh, positivity in the community. <coughs> From those who uh, HIV positive, we enroll it's 72 partners, 72 percent of partners, and 65 percent of uh, children. I just wanted to highlight: we consider enrolled patient who comes to the health facility, opens the file, and ha has the appointment with the clinician at the same day of the opening of the file. <clears throat> For the TB patients, we had 219 index TB patients, and this is a data from January to September, as the TB platform just was just developed in this year. So from 219 index TB uh, patients, we were able to con register the contacts, uh, 559 contacts, and most of the contacts were in age group of 5 to 14 years old. From those registered with the positive screening, 100% re were referred to health, to health, facility, health facility and more than 80% arrived at health facility. And from those who arrived, 18 has diagnosed of TB and 87% uh, of the, uh, those uh, arrived also started IPT in group of less than five years old. And others from five to 14 years started IPT because of the co-infection with HIV. So our main success are uh, the, we improve the flow of the patient in the health facility. We improve the linkage of health facility and the community. We started the uh, family approach and follow-up of, of mom and baby pair. We are now able to measure, map the reason of defaulters. Also, we implemented a concept for the visit. In the health facility, all the patients are, uh, are asked and filled and signed the concept for the home visit. If they are not willing to receive any home visit, then they don't uh, sign the form. Uh, we can also uh, now report the community activity through the platform, patient literacy. We have educational and mentorship package for edu uh, activists in the platform. We can also do the evaluation of nutrition and monitor and mentorship of activities activity through the platform. Our main challenge at this moment are uh, the address are not correct, so we are working on the correction of the address, as I mentioned before. Uh, the activists have multiple tasks of uh, for the community activity because they are not just working in TB and HIV field; they work also in other fields such as malaria, diarrhea, and pneumonia. Uh, the number of visits per activist is also increasing because they have to do the screening and the follow-up visit. So we are we are now uh, allocating different activists for different uh, patients. All family members testing in same days. This is also difficult because uh, most of the patients uh, 
and family members are not at home during the home visit. So the activists have to go back three, two, four times and sometimes even in the weekends to find the old member of the house. And also the issue of disclosure of HIV. This is a difficult task for activists because you, they need a specific knowledge to de deliver this component. For the, so the next steps are the finalized TB model for follow-up and MDR TB, expansion of platform for the priority district and advocacy with the Ministry of Health to, Im to implement this in the country. And thank you for the, our donors, PEPFAR, ELMA Foundation and Ministry of Health of Mozambique. Thank you so much, Neha, and thank you to all of our presenters, all of whom have presented uh, their respective presentations several times today. So we thank them for their patience and uh, commitment to really sharing all of the evidence that they've gathered. And they've, uh, I think, talked a lot about new technologies, point of care and mobile phones, as well as the importance of targeted testing um, and that really is customized to the, the um, epidemic in, in their setting. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Elvin Gang to help moderate our Q&A. So please feel free to type in a question. Um, and El Elvin, if you have any overarching comments as well that you want to provide, um, please, you're welcome. Um, yeah, thanks. It looks like um, there are a number of questions that may be coming in. Um, and I see that one's just popped uh, through. I mean, I think overall, these are really very exciting presentations and uh, a lot of um, really intriguing information. Um, and let, let me start with the, the first one, which has uh, been answered a little bit, but I think the first one goes to, to you, Esmeralda. Um, could you say a few words about the activists? Um, so, sort of, I think the first question that was po posed was whether or not they were volunteers, but any other information about them? You said they work cross-sectorally, um, but but you know maybe about uh, their their training or background or uh, just a, a little context about who these folks are. I think would be helpful. So we, before we uh, in, the, in the beginning we were working with activists who does the volunteer working. Uh, in the community as the malaria screening, uh, and diarrhea, pneumonia screening. Uh, and then we, we saw that the, we need activists with little bit more skills for the TB and HIV and also to use the platform. So we started to work with activists who work uh, in the health facility and also in the community because they have uh, all the HIV and TB area. And also with the, of course, we are looking for the artists who can manage also the, the platform. So mostly, mostly they are activists which work in both sides, but they receive a, a training before they go to the field. <laughs> okay, yeah, thanks. I'll take the first one. Um, in terms of where to place the, the POC, uh, uh, the platforms, as, as I said earlier, the, the, there is a selection criteria uh, which was arrived at within the technical working group. So those sites, they had to look at the volume of tests that were done. Okay, they used 2015 data. So at least it had to be a site which had a median, at that time they used a median of at least 0.5 tests per day. Yeah, meaning that, uh, you know, that should be uh, a site where indeed they can see this need. Then they also looked at uh, what we call either the, you know, the demand or, uh, you know, uh, the, the uptake, yeah. So there again, uh, the the committee uh, looked at uh, you know the number of HIV positive uh, pregnancies that were there vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the number of you know the in the infants that actually had the EID test. So so as to establish the gap. 
then uh, of course it follows uh, the national uh, you know uh, EID network so we do have already established hubs and spokes so the hubs that you know now take uh, the samples to the national reference lab so it's easier to work within these existing hubs and scale up uh, so as to you know uh, put the, the point of care in terms of uh, sustainability uh, yes, it would be sustainable. I think one of the egg puff countries already did some cost-effective analysis. Yeah, if you look at it in short term, it might not look to be so less expensive. It's almost the same. But when you look at it from a public health point of view, yeah, of being able to identify infants early and putting them on treatment, then we look at it from two points. Yeah, because now we have. Uh, less children uh, dying and also improving life expectancy. But then again, in terms of sustainability, in terms of manpower, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, um, it doesn't need a trained lab technician. So I think it should be something which is easier than what we have currently, which requires, you know, uh, a technical, you know, a, a lab technician. Uh, in terms of self-testing, I think the self-testing for us, that is, it will be great opportunity, especially for the adolescents. When we talk of older than 18 months, for the younger children, I think it will still be an issue because even the, the guidelines, the consent age is from 15 and above. But for uh, our adolescents, especially, we have adolescents who are even in key populations, for adolescents, you know, who are already very active. So I think for us, it will come in handy as one of the approaches that we really want to, to try, yeah. Great. Um, thanks, Janet. Uh, Jessica, yeah. Then, uh, yeah, the next one. Who pays for the recruiting pediatric counselors? Are they kept in Alma Private and are they integrated into the government or routine uh, delivery uh, infrastructure? Yeah, uh, thank you. So for the pediatric uh, HTS counselors, um, they're being paid for by the project, but they're integrated and uh, would I say that you know institutionalized within the government structures. So if they are placed in the facility, the facility normally has like a counselor supervisor and there's also depending on where they're placed, they still have to, you know, in terms of reporting line and structures have to go within the government. And when we are doing the recruitment, we do it together. So it means that the facility in charge is involved uh, and also somebody senior at the county level. And also when we do appraisals, we do together. So it's uh, it, the project pays, but they kind of just fall within their like part of the government, uh, you know, uh, service providers, even with the reporting time, apart from maybe if they have to maybe do an odd hour testing or a weekend testing, but generally, uh, even the government code of ethics, when we are doing the orientation, we get somebody from the government that takes them through. This is the government code of ethics. This is how we work in our institution. So they blend within the government system. Yeah. Right. Um, thanks for that. That is, uh, uh, it looks like there's a, potentially another question coming through. Um, hopefully we'll get that in just a second. Yeah, I think the, the, the question is related to the issue of oh. sustainability. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, congrats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. In terms of yeah, the the the, the payment terms are within. Uh, so we they are not paid higher than the other civil servants. We do have our labor laws. So ideally, they come like uh, they are not ECPAF employees. Neither are they government employees. So when they are hired, they are hired as volunteers. But they do have a stipend. Yeah, they do have a stipend, um, and of course, with that stipend, still the, our government requires that you give some kind of uh, of gratuity. In terms of uh, sustainability, uh, that is why now we engage the government. Yeah, because at the time that we are recruiting, we work together with the government because the county government also does recruitment, and when they are doing recruitment, they want to recruit people who already have experience 
people who have been performing well. So when we are doing appraisals together, they also take note of when the next time the county government might be recruiting, these are the people whom we might need. And again, we only recruit where there's a gap. So if the government or the ministry or another partner already has, you know, um, adequate um, councillors, then we don't need. Yeah, but there's some cases where you go and ideally you see there's a gap and it's even requested uh, by the ministry or by the facility. All right, well, thanks. Um, it looks like we're up upon the hour, so I think that um, we'll wrap up. I want to thank uh, everyone who was listening in and uh, who sent through uh, some important and provocative questions, and want to thank our speakers once again uh, for those presentations. So thank you very much. Jessica, do you want to? Yes. Uh, Thank you, uh, Alvin, and thank you again to all of our presenters um, who shared their results and uh, potential solutions to one of the challenges we're facing, which is that only half of children exposed to HIV are, are tested. And really, I think it's imperative that we create a sense of urgency, and it's also encouraging that um, all of uh, people working on the front lines are finding some potential solutions that can be scaled up. And with that in mind, please stay tuned for tomorrow's webinar, which will talk about another huge challenge that we're facing um, in the HIV response, which is how to close the pediatric treatment gap. And so tomorrow, um, some uh, key feature presentations will be shared. Uh, about that issue. So we thank all of you for staying on. Please um, feel free to uh, share any of the presentations and the recording with your colleagues because the objective of uh, our learning collaborative is really to disseminate the learning as far and wide as possible. Um, so we thank uh, Luan Hatani, the executive director of PATA for allowing us to collaborate and supporting this collaboration. And we look forward to the webinar tomorrow. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out with me to me, and I will also put you in touch with any of the presenters if you have any questions. Uh, thank you all, and uh, see you tomorrow.